Thanks, uh, Kendra. I appreciate the introduction and, and thanks for having me uh, to discuss this you know, incredibly important and timely topic. Uh, and, you know, I, I know the audience is a bit diverse, uh, which is great. Uh, what I'm going to do is try to multitask and monitor the chat, monitor the Q&A and, and talk at the same time. So if I flub, you'll have to be understanding and compassionate with me. Uh, but I think that uh, as long as the chat doesn't go too fast, I'll try to answer questions in real time, but sometimes it does fly and it's, it's hard to pay attention. Uh, but, you know, so, so where I come uh, from in this is obviously you heard about what I do. <clears throat> I am an emergency physician. I, I work at University Hospital in Newark, uh, a part of Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. Um, and my background is in emergency medicine and medical toxicology. And medical toxicology is a study of human poisoning. And you know, I spent most of my career in New York. I came here to New Jersey, although I've lived in New Jersey for a long time. I came here about five years ago uh, to take over the position that I have here. And uh, fortunately for me as a medical toxicologist within my department is the New Jersey Poison Information Education System or NJ Pies, which most of us just call the New Jersey Poison Center. Um, we are a clearinghouse, a, an information center and, a, and an advice management center for both the public and for, for healthcare providers. And many of you have either called us in your personal or professional lives and hopefully everything's worked out uh, fairly well after that. Uh, but we do obviously um, serve to some extent as a sentinel for emerging drugs and, and drug trends uh, both exposures <clears throat> among children and, and others and overdoses among uh, users and, you know, incidental exposures and, um, you know, fatal exposures and some of our work done with the medical examiner's office and other and other groups. And you heard I do a lot of work with some of the federal agencies that have looked at this and it's really been, you know, a great pleasure of mine to be able to participate in, in the development of some of the guidelines and protocols and other things that we have looking at um, at substance use and sort of I focused most of my later part of my career on on opioids and <clears throat> as you'll see excuse me uh fentanyl has really just become a big part of that and I know many of you deal with fentanyl in, in various ways some again on a personal level some on a professional level some academically um, and there may be um, a number of positions that are held here that don't agree with what I have to say <coughs> excuse me and I'm going to try to be as objective as possible um and as and as um as uh, credible as possible. But, you know, like a lot of things, there are facts and there are, there are sort of interpretations of facts and misconceptualizations of facts. And my, my goal here is not to present you with a data heavy, data heavy, highly evidence based discussion of best practices and things like that. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with the basics. And I think really understanding the basics will help people think through some of the very complex issues we deal with when it comes to use, um, um, uh, addiction, and, you know, substance, uh, op opioid use disorder, uh, treatment, and, and poisoning and death. And I think these are all really important parts about what we do on a daily basis. Again, whether you read it in the newspaper or live it in your real life, I think they're all incredibly important. Um, as you can imagine, I have no conflicts to declare. Um, no, nobody wants to fund the kind of work that I do, um, which is probably a good thing. Everybody is aware of the opioid crisis, and I, I don't think this is news to anybody on the call. I think we each have our own ways of expressing how important it is, and this is sort of one of the things that I find most fascinating. Most of you are probably you know, old enough to know that for the vast majority of your life, our life expectancy has increased, except over the past five years or so, our life expectancy has actually started to decrease. And it's the first time in probably since the pandemic of 1918 uh, that our life expectancy is really uh, shortened. And it really is due to opioids and, and poisoning, right? And if you look, we made great successes in cancer treatment and heart disease. But if you look at things, and these are all sort of linked, at least not Alzheimer's, but, but unintentional injuries, poisoning and opioids, suicide are all linked to drug use, right? And it's just such a telling part about the society that we live in today, that that opioids and the opioid crisis or the opioid epidemic, whatever you like to call it, has had such an impact on our on our day to day existence. Some of you might have suffered personal and family losses related to some of you might actually suffer from opioid use disorder and hopefully are in you know in, in recovery and are, and are doing well and maybe have family members or friends that are like that. But it's hard to say that for the society this is not had a major impact. And I just like to show this timeline because it's very important for people to understand. 
Um, <clears throat> You know, since the mid to late 90s, when we've really started to see an increased focus on the use of opioids in, in pain management, uh, we started to see an increase in deaths related to the natural and semi-synthetic opioids. And remember, the natural op opioids, sometimes called the opiates, are morphine and codeine. All, right, all the other things we think about uh, are semi-synthetic, or the things we think about as, as medicinal are semi-synthetic, oxycodone, which is Percocet, hydrocodone, which is Vicodin and Norco, uh, hydromorphone, which is diluted. All of those are semi-synthetics. And I'll show you some structures later and you'll get a sense of what that looks like. But they're basically a morphine molecule to which various things have been stuck on, a hydroxyl group, a methyl group. And they basically created them from a natural product, so these semi-synthesized Right. And you can see that, it, although unimpressive on the scale it's shown here, the number of, of deaths per 100,000 have really risen over the past two decades or so. And maybe they've sort of plateaued a little bit in the past few years um, with some of the changes we've tried to implement, but it's, uh, it's not certainly been a major public health success in any, in any way. Uh, the the, the 800-pound gorilla in the room of the semi-synthetic opioids, of course, is oxycodone, and the formulation most relevant is the one that had been made by Purdue, which everybody knows is OxyContin, which is basically taking a short-acting opioid, oxycodone, which you find again in Percocet, and, con and making it into a long-acting, highly concentrated form of oxycodone. So in that little pill, you take it once or twice a day, and it lasts the whole day, as opposed to taking it four or six times a day like you would have to do with the natural preparation. If you just took plain oxycodone or if you took oxycodone plus acetaminophen in the Percocet formulation. Roxycodone is another version of that, which is plain oxycodone. Percocet contains acetaminophen. Um, one of the things that people learn pretty quickly about the OxyContin preparation is that because it had a high concentration of oxycodone in the pill, in order to let it last the whole day, you can crack the pill open and you get a lot of oxycodone out. So it became a major public health problem with people using high dose oxycodone in the form of OxyContin um, formulation. So in 2010, the FDA required that the product be reformulated into what was called an abuse deterrent or sometimes called a tamper resistant formulation, which wasn't crushable or meltable or microwavable and you couldn't extract out the oxycodone. Right. And what you'll see <clears throat> is while you can kind of make out to some, if you squint a little bit, you can say maybe the level flattened off a little bit of death related to uh, the semi-synthetics, right, like oxycodone. It really was, you know, again, not the major impact everybody expected. And at the same time that the oxycodone was reformulated, we started to see a reduction in the price of heroin and an increase in period on the street. And this line heroin related death started to rise. It always been a baseline level of heroin death. Right? And most of those people had started using heroin, in, you know, per se. Many of the people now using heroin were folks who converted from the, the semi-synthetics like oxycodone to heroin because the oxycodone was not as abuse prone because it was reformulated and it was not as available because doctors started prescribing less of it. Right? And so we started to see the heroin, heroin death uh, uh, numbers rise. Well, around 2013, we really started to see in earnest the arrival of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs or derivatives or congeners or whatever you want to call them. Some just say fentanyl with an S at the end, or fentanyls or fentalogs. Right? And what you saw here is just nothing more than mind blowing. But from 2013 to 2020, we've converted our epidemic from one of you know, semi-synthetics and heroin which are still a big problem, to one of the synthetic opioids. Now, the synthetic opioids really mean fentanyl. Methadone synthetic as well, but that methadone is separated out here. You can see it's been a small bit player in the, problem, in the process, whereas fentanyl itself has been just skyrocketing. Again, I would not say we don't have a prescription opioid or a heroin epidemic anymore. We still do, but we really have a fentanyl problem, right? We have a fentanyl crisis going on right now. <clears throat> um, how big a problem is it? Well, listen, this is just from yesterday's news. <laughs> you know, I just pulled it up this morning to show everybody, or, or at least one of them was from last week, just because it's so interesting. But you can see at a school in Connecticut, a, a child died uh, after bringing 40 bags of fentanyl to school. How he got them are, is unknown, but he used the fentanyl at school and was found dead in the bathroom. Right? You can see a nine-month-old in California, 
uh, was exposed, presumably, since nine months old, don't do very much, presumably exposed by his parents, um, who either left it around while the kid was rolling around or, or gave it to the child to comfort them, nobody really knows, but we see that periodically as well. And then you can see at the bottom, you know, a very sad case of a, of a kid in New Jersey who, who was using what he thought was presumably fairly safe drug and it had fentanyl uh, adulterated um, or fentanyl as an adulterate excuse me, in, the, in the product. We don't know what he was using. We don't know where he got it. There's a lot of unknowns, but this is just a typical story that you see. And he's one of those spike cases uh, that we see on that um, rising tail of the, uh, of the fentanyl. Um, <clears throat> epidemic that we're seeing right now. Um, in response to the teenager dying in school, uh, they're going to now start keeping naloxone in the school. Uh, it's a sad state of affairs that many schools in New Jersey, New York, many libraries uh, and other places now keep, fed, now keep naloxone, I hope I said naloxone before, keep naloxone in school or in, in, in the library because people just go there and overdose. And you know, short of that, um, without any sort of special medical education, it's not much you can really offer these folks in, in a real time basis. You know, perhaps if you were willing to do mouth to mouth res resuscitation on these people, and many of us are not, uh, you know, that would provide a lot of benefit, uh, obviously, because remember, the reason you die from an opioid is simply you don't breathe. There's nothing else really that kills you. Um, but most of us are not really ready to do that. So having naloxone available is helpful. We'll talk a little bit about naloxone later um, and why it's important in this venue. Uh, but clearly this is a public health problem. Uh, if any of you have seen this, this is data that we see on a weekly basis uh, that looks at confiscated drug samples, uh, op uh, heroin samples, and I put heroin in quotes here because as you'll see pretty, pretty clearly is that no heroin sample that has been confiscated contains only heroin, right? Some of them, many of them contain no heroin whatsoever. And many of them contain a mix of heroin and fentanyl. But if you just look down, ANPP is a precursor of fentanyl, right? Fluorofentanyl, xylosine is a sedative that's often added to, to fentanyl these days for somewhat unclear reasons, but we see it particularly in Southern New Jersey, but we see it all around uh, the state as well. And you'll see there's many just fentanyl only samples. And these are again, all within just the past couple of weeks or months that we've seen this. And it's really important to recognize the fact there is essentially no such thing as heroin anymore. It's all quote unquote heroin because it contains everything, sometimes including heroin, often not including heroin. And it's also important to remember, and many people remember Prince, of course, <clears throat> Prince died of a prescription opioid overdose. But if you, if you dig a little bit deeper, the Vicodin that he purchased actually contained fentanyl. And it was a, it was a, um, a, uh, um, I'm liking on the word. It was a, uh, a, a tablet that was purchased, you know, on the street, um, believing that it contained fentanyl. I believe that it contained uh, hydrocodone, but when they did the postmortem in, in his stomach, when you see the autopsy results, which are publicly available, he had a, a stomach full of fentanyl. So these supposed Vicodin tablets were adulterated or completely containing perhaps fentanyl. So the um, counterfeit pills that people find on the street are, are very concerning. So it's possible that 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 student we talked about earlier, I'm sorry, the, the person in Southern Jersey who died of a, of a fentanyl overdose might have taken a pill that he thought was, you know, oxy or, or hydro. Um, it's also possible he bought cocaine that has uh, fentanyl in it. And we've been seeing that in an increasing proportion. It's still a pretty small problem. Um, but you can see why people would do that, right? In the, in the old days, people used to use speedballs, which is a combination of heroin and cocaine. Right, heroin's a bit of a downer, but it's a euphoriant. Cocaine is a bit of an upper and it's euphoriant. So if you take them together, you can use more of both, or you can sort of stave off one complication of respiratory depression and coma with the other, which is hyper excitation and, psych you know, and psychomotor excess. So together, it actually provides, a, in a backwards kind of way, a bit of safety. Of course, it's not safer, 
but at least in concept, you can see why one would mitigate the effects of the other. So you can see why it's been added to cocaine. It's been offered up that it's been added to, to cannabis as well. And I think the data to support its addition to cannabis is exceptionally weak. And part of the problem is just why. To ask the question, why would somebody do that? You can see, as I just explained, why somebody might add it to cocaine. But there's no good explanation why somebody would add it to cannabis. It doesn't provide any real benefit. It adds an expense. It increases the risk. And, you know, from a, from a business uh, perspective, the last thing you really want to do is sort of kill off your clientele. So adding, adding a dangerous drug like that to a preparation that's generally pretty safe, and I don't want to get into the politics of cannabis, um, doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, it turns out that because our testing technology is so good, it's very likely <clears throat> that the that the fentanyl that was found in the cannabis, and I'm not going to argue that it was not found, I believe it was found, was probably an incidental exposure from somebody's hands or from a tabletop where the cannabis or the marijuana was sitting at some point, <clears throat> and not a drug that was intentionally added. It was probably in such a low concentration that it has no clinically um, concerning risk associated with it. And it's most likely that the people who died from quote unquote adulterated cannabis probably also used fentanyl. Given the concentrations of fentanyl they had versus the amounts that we think were present in the cannabis itself, it's probably not credible that the cannabis was actually laced with fentanyl, but rather it had a tiny little contamination, but the people that died also used fentanyl. Right. Now, there is fentanyl, which you can see in the top left, but then there's the fentanyls, right? all of the other agents that we see that are derived from fentanyl by adding a functional group to it. Right? And many of you have heard of carfentanil and maybe furanofentanil, I think I showed you on the last slide, by adding these furan groups and other, other carbon-containing functions. And you can see just in an analysis done by the, F, by the DEA that the vast majority of fentanyl on the street is, in fact, simply fentanyl. But there are other fentanyl derivatives. Carfentanil has been one that we're very concerned about. And I'll show you why in a, in a moment. Um, we don't see a lot of this. And if you looked at that slide I showed you before, most of the fentanyl was fentanyl. It wasn't carfentanil, it wasn't butyrol fentanyl, it wasn't any of the others. It was just plain old fentanyl. And that's pretty much what we see. And that's what most people see uh, when they go and look for this. But one of the things, one of the issues it raises, and for those that are, are, are very uh, interested in harm reduction, which I certainly am, uh, I, I often question the value of fentanyl testing strips. Now, independent of their legal status in the state and in other states around the country, uh, and whether they should be considered drug paraphernalia or, or true sort of medical approaches to harm reduction, I'm not really sure how useful they are in a population where 100% of the drug that you're going to use contains fentanyl. Because in the day when it was 10% or 5% of the heroin containing fentanyl, you might make a decision based on this extra knowledge. But knowing now that it has fentanyl uh, in the supply is a very limited benefit since all of the drug has fentanyl. And I'm not sure how you're going to, it doesn't tell you how much fentanyl there is. It just says it has fentanyl in it. Now, it might be helpful in people who use cocaine or people use methamphetamine, which have been, as I've mentioned already, adulterated with fentanyl. So in those populations might be helpful, but using it to test your heroin seems of almost no benefit to me. And I'm not, I'm not sure that there's gonna be any way to prove that decisions could be changed based on that knowledge that we now have. So here, just to show you um, a nice comparison from the internet, this is not my um, drug supply. Um, this is the lethal amount of heroin in the, on the left, a lethal amount of fentanyl in the middle. It's about 50 times the potency of heroin, about 80 times the potency of morphine. And carfentanil, which is 100 times the potency of fentanyl. So you can see that the lethal amount of carfentanil is nearly invisible, right? which makes it so incredibly dangerous. Fentanyl is incredibly dangerous too, because you can see that if you don't, if you don't dose it properly, it's very easy to get into trouble if you think you're going to be using heroin. Now, most drug dealers have figured out how to safely add fentanyl to the drug supply without killing their clients. But it's not uncommon that blips occur. And you'll see these little pockets of overdose where the fentanyl is a little bit stronger or a little bit, I should say, more concentrated 
in a given supply of heroin, and you'll start seeing a little bit of a, of a, of a rash of overdoses or even deaths occurring. We used to see these, you're going back 20 or 25 years, fentanyl has been around a long time. And we used to have the China White, the Tango and Cash, and many people remember some of these things from, from prior decades. Uh, now we don't really call them anything. We just know that we see these spikes in, in overdoses and deaths that occur spontaneously. And then they go away because the dealers realize that they shouldn't be doing that anymore. But I want to be really clear. There's nothing inherently toxic or more toxic about fentanyl than any other opioid. Right? If you took a given amount of heroin and you adjusted the, fentanyl's, uh, the fentanyl uh, potency, you can give a safe dose of fentanyl. We do it every day in the emergency department. We do it every day in the operating room, right? You just have to dose it properly and it's going to be fine. Same thing with carfentanil. There's nothing inherently unsafe about carfentanil. If you dose it properly, you need to use 100 times less carfentanil than you do fentanyl and 50 times less fentanyl than you do heroin, at least in concept. Of course, if you're going to adulterate the heroin, you have to put less heroin in if you're going to add fentanyl or carfentanil to it. And same thing with the fentanyl. But if you could easily do this, if you were able to calculate the doses that you were mixing and using in, in an adequate way. Of course, if you add too much carfentanil or fentanyl to an existing supply of heroin, you're gonna overdose. And this is what you see when we say dangerous doses, this is overdose doses. And of course, if you add too much, it's not hard to see how those doses become deadly. Right? Remember, death from opioids is only related to respiratory depression and apnea. Right, of course, there's endocarditis and all kinds of things that are chronic exposure, needle use and stuff. But when I'm talking about acutely dying of heroin, short of crashing your car while you're you know, using while you're driving or walking on the ledge of a building and falling off or getting into a fight, and beaten up, if you're going to die of the drug itself, you're going to die of respiratory depression. So I just want to talk about some of the terms quickly that I've already talked about. These are what I'm going to go through real quickly. Some of you might be interested in this. Some of you may think this is pharmacological mumbo jumbo, but, but bear with me if you, if you don't mind. Um, this is potency. Potency basically says how much of a dose of a drug does it take to get a clinical a given effect. If this effect is analgesia, this effect could be respiratory depression. This effect could be death, in which case we call it an LV50. Right? But this is the dose it takes to get a given effect. So if I were to ask you, and I know there's no response here, but if I were to ask you which of, which of these A or B is heroin and which is fentanyl, would you, what would you say? Remember, this is how much of a dose it takes to get a given effect. So think about that for yourself. And I'll give you the answer. Right? It takes less fentanyl to have a given effect then it takes heroin. So fentanyl is considered to be more potent. Potency is how many milligrams per kilogram or micrograms per kilogram amount does it take to have an effect. So fentanyl is more potent than heroin. Right? If we want to put morphine, it would be out here because it's less potent than heroin still. Carfentanil would be over here because it's more potent than fentanyl. But potency, as I've already kind of tried to highlight, doesn't matter. As long as you adjust the dose for the potency, carfentanil is perfectly safe. Right? It's just really hard to adjust safely the dose of a drug that's that potent. Right? Tiny little errors can lead to double or triple or a hundredfold dosing errors, which you can see with a drug like carfentanil or fentanyl is really problematic. If you double the dose of fentanyl because its potency is fairly low, it's not usually a big deal. If you double the dose of fentanyl or carfentanil because its potency is so high, it might actually be a big problem. And I'm sorry, when I say double the dose, I mean double the amount, right? Just given the potency, right? As long as you keep the dose appropriate to the potency, it shouldn't really be a problem. This is, this is a tenet of toxicology. There's one thing to walk away from today with any fact that you put in your brain. Remember what Paracelsus said. He said, what is there that's not a poison? Only the dose determines that a thing is a poison or not. I paraphrased him, right? So carfentanil is equally as poisonous as fentanyl, which is equally as poisonous as heroin. As long as you take the same dose, they're equally poisonous or not as poisonous. Everything is poisonous. Water is poisonous, right? not just drowning, but you can drink yourself to water poisoning. Right? We call it water intoxication. It's hyponatremia. Oxygen is toxic. Right? If you breathe 100% oxygen for a couple of hours, you're going to get pulmonary toxicity. You can have a seizure. Everything is toxic. 
And everything is non-toxic too. There's doses of cyanide and botulinum toxin and everything else that are low enough to not be problematic. Right? We give people Botox and they don't know die of botulism because we know the dose we're giving is right. Dose makes the poison. Four words, just to remember. Lipophilicity is really important among drugs too, right? So the more lipophilic a drug is, the more rapidly it gets into your brain. Because we don't inject drugs directly into the brain, but we put them in our stomach or we put them in our veins, it has to get it across the blood-brain barrier into the brain. The only way across the blood-brain barrier is to dissolve across it, is to diffuse across it. And that rate of diffusion is 100% related to the lipophilicity or at least largely related to lipophilicity. <clears throat> so as you can imagine, you add a methyl group to morphine and codeine becomes more rapidly able to cross the blood-brain barrier. Heroin, even more so, because it has two acetyl groups. Fentanyl would be just like heroin. It would actually be a little higher than heroin if I drew it on here, right? Fentanyl has a very high lipophilicity. This is lipophilicity, right? What we sometimes call the octanol water partition coefficient. You dissolve it in water, you dissolve it in a lipid, and you measure how much goes between the two. And that ratio is the octanal water partition coefficient, right? Lipophilicity equals reward, meaning it makes you feel good, right? The faster it gets into your brain, the better you feel, right? And the better you feel, the more you likely are to quote unquote, abuse it. And abuse here means use for the pleasure that something, a substance causes, right? So the rewarding factor of a lipophilic drug is very high. If I took morphine and injected it into your brain, it would basically be just like heroin. But because morphine's poorly soluble, but poorly lipid soluble, it gets across the blood brain barrier very slowly. We talk a lot about naloxone, great harm reduction strategy. I think everybody should carry it. I think we should, we should be giving it out as a state Right, we've done that a couple of times. It's been very successful. It needs to be available. Many people have said erroneously that naloxone doesn't reverse fentanyl because fentanyl is too potent. And there's some truth to that and there's some non-truth to that. And I think you have to be really careful how you state that. Right? If I give you a normal dose of fentanyl, naloxone will reverse it very easily. If I give you a monstrous dose of fentanyl or a monstrous dose of morphine for that matter, or a monstrous dose of heroin, because these are competitive antagonists, they bind to the same receptor and one binds and the other can either knock it off or, or get knocked off uh, because they compete for that receptor. The relative concentrations of the drug at that receptor become important. But naloxone works really, really well for fentanyl. If I give you a massive overdose of fentanyl, it's not going to work. But most people don't have massive doses of fentanyl when they overdose, right? They just take the right amount to get high. They're not taking monstrous doses to kill themselves. Sometimes there's a problem with the formulation, like I said, and it leads to these little epidemics of overdose and death. Sometimes those people don't respond to naloxone, but that's only when the naloxone, I'm sorry, that's only when the fentanyl dose that's been added to that mixture is so high, so out of whack. But that's rare. That's really rare. And this is all about affinity, right? The affinity of naloxone is much higher than the affinity of fentanyl. And remember, affinity is a KI. So it's, it's an inverse relationship. The lower the number, the higher the affinity. So naloxone easily drop, knocks fentanyl off of that receptor, right? So if you take some fentanyl and I give you naloxone, naloxone is going to knock it off. If you take a massive amount of fentanyl, I don't give you a large amount of naloxone, it's not going to work. But the vast majority of people get better with naloxone. And we, we've actually scaled back our dose of naloxone that we give. Right? For people that practice medicine or worked in an emergency department or some other place that you give naloxone, we used to give a standard dose of 0.4 milligrams IV. We now give 0.04 milligrams IV. Right? Not because... Fentanyl naloxone works any better, but because the risks of high, don high dose naloxone are very real. There's a lot of precipitated withdrawal, which I'll talk about in a moment. But recently, FDA made a bad decision, in my, in my uh, opinion, was they approved a higher dose intranasal formulation of naloxone, eight milligrams instead of four. Personally, I think they should have cut four to two because the risk of precipitated withdrawal is so high and the drug works really, really well. <clears throat> 
right? Most people that have to get multiple doses of naloxone to quote unquote get better, either are taking other drugs besides naloxone and uh, besides fentanyl. There's a lot of benzo on the street and other drugs that are on the street, a lot of xylazine in the, in the mixture that doesn't respond. But if the response you're expecting is full arousal, then it's not gonna work. If the response you're expecting is to breathe better, it will always work, almost, it will almost always work at a two milligram dose. So the four milligram dose just serves to cause precipitate withdrawal. The eight milligram dose seems completely unnecessary. And many people have unrealistic expectations of the speed. They think it's television. They think you stick the thing in somebody's nose and they, they, they wake up and start, you know, and they're, they're better. They're, you know, they're, that's not how it works. It still takes two, three, four minutes before the person really comes to, comes to, to be, uh, you know, to be aroused, to be aware. To, but, but that's what you need, right? Most people aren't about to die when they get in a lockdown. Most people just have very slow breathing. And they can survive the other in the minute or two it takes for that drug to start working. Because people who use opioids develop tolerance, right? Where right initially they have no opioid in the receptor. Initially, it takes a little bit to cause the effect, but over time it takes larger amounts of drug to cause the effect because they develop tolerance. Along with tolerance comes dependence. Tolerance is the need for more drug to have an effect. Dependence is the fact without the drug you withdraw. Right? People who are tolerant and dependent, when they stop using drugs, they develop withdrawal, which is absence weight. That occurs over 24 hours. It's miserable, but they do fine. People who are tolerant and, de and dependent on that drug who get naloxone, develop precipitated withdrawal, right? That's naloxone. They go from zero to 60 instantly, and they suffer terribly. Now, I would agree that if it's choice between dying and withdrawal, you would always take withdrawal, but it's very rarely that level of decision-making. Usually most people can wait the minute or two without dying. And if you can do if you can do mouth to mouth, if it's a family member or a friend, you even have less of a pressure to give the locks. And remember the eight milligram dose isn't necessary here. It's really the two milligram dose that you need to get. Giving naloxone is great. And if you reverse the person, you save their life, quote unquote. Remember, most people aren't saved with naloxone, right? They, they are reversed from naloxone because most of people wouldn't die without naloxone. Remember, we're, we're not, it's not like every person who overdoses dies. Most people overdose do fine and they wake up to overdose the next day again and the day after that because that's the natural history of opioid use, right? So naloxone is nice. It's important. I'm a huge supporter. I'm a big believer in naloxone distribution, but I think we have to be thoughtful about the unintended consequences of it. Most people who wake up after naloxone, guess what? Go on to use drugs and overdose again. So we're in the habit of saying that naloxone itself doesn't really save lives. And this is very morose. It simply delays death. You need to get these people into drug treatment. And we spend a lot of time talking about this. And this is something we put together for the emergency department. There's, there's lots of people looking at this in every specialty, in every area. How do you get people to stop using opioids? Well, you know, unlike every other drug we have out there, opioids have a really great pharmacological therapy, and that's buprenorphine, right? And buprenorphine is a partial agonist, which means it doesn't, it doesn't work like a full agonist, like all the other opioids we talked about, which would kill you if you took too much of it, but there's a ceiling effect on its respiratory depression. If you take too much full agonist, you stop breathing. Take too much buprenorphine, you'll never stop breathing, right? Because it's a partial agonist. It only partially stimulates at that receptor. We say it has partial efficacy at the receptor, right? But one of the problems with fentanyl is that people develop such deep dependence meaning they are so, so at risk of withdrawing that when you give them a partial agonist, which doesn't have the full agonist effect of the opioid they're using, it actually causes precipitated withdrawal. I hope you're following that because it's really important. People who use fentanyl are at much greater risk of developing precipitated withdrawal from buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist, it's not a full agonist, than people who use other opioids. Right? That's what makes it so hard to manage this population. Remember, one of the reasons that 
this occurs is because lip, you, you'll remember fentanyl is exceptionally lipophilic. When you use fentanyl once, it gets into your blood, it goes into your brain, it comes down, it goes into your tissues, and it just disappears. When you use it all the time, your tissue levels build up to fairly high levels and leach out over time. So overnight, when most people use heroin, we're letting their receptors reset because the blood levels have fallen to nothing. People who use fentanyl have a continuous blood level, even when they go to sleep at night. So their receptors are always being stimulated by that opioid. So they never reset. So the dependence that you get, the tolerance you get from fentanyl is much greater than it is with all the other opioids because of its lipophilic properties. That's what makes getting onto buprenorphine so difficult. It's much more typical like you see with methadone than it is in you see with heroin. I want to take, take a minute just to talk about drug testing. Right? Many of you have seen these patients, depending on where you work or where you, where you, where you, uh, where you talk to people. Um, we see this all the time. We'll get people who come with an opioid overdose, we'll get their urine tox test back, and their tox test is negative. But they've had an opioid overdose. They might even respond to naloxone. And the reason is, is that our urine tox test doesn't look for fentanyl. It looks like most do for morphine. They're antibody-based. Right? So there's an antibody direct against morphine. It doesn't find heroin because this big, this bulky acetyl group blocks the antibody, but it can find oxy and it easily finds hydro. But it doesn't find fentanyl and it doesn't find methadone. You need special assays, which many hospitals now are using and we're starting to implement those here as well. And I'm sorry, I'm not following the chat as well as I hope to. I said, there's just too many things going on for me, but I'll get to those at the end. Um, so urine tox testing is very limited unless you specifically develop an antibody directed against fentanyl or against methanol. They're easy to find, you just have to look for them. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about some of the media that we, we hear about when it comes to fentanyl. Uh, you'll read things like this. These guys had enough fentanyl to kill the entire population of New York and New Jersey combined, whatever number of 30 million people that is. Right, or, or some number. Well, that may be a true statement. If you said that it took, you know, I don't know, five micrograms per kilogram to kill every person, you multiply that by 20 million, and you got the number of kilograms they had, that might be true. But think about how you actually you get all that drug into all those people. It's just not going to happen. So this makes for great media headlines and it's very sensationalistic and people did a bad thing and they should go to jail and nobody's going to argue that. But the messaging here is pretty off, right? It's pretty off. It's, it's really giving, you know, it, it, it's, it's stigmatizing an entire population of people who use substances. This is fentanyl. It's not cyanide. It's not plutonium, right? It's a drug that people use. And to frame it in this way, really, again, not, not condoning what these folks did, but you have to sort of think about the messaging as we start to put this stuff out. Many of you have been following some of the craziness in the law, in law enforcement exposure world. And it's not just law enforcement, it's other people too. In fact, at that school up in Connecticut, uh, I'll, I'll remind me if I remember, I'll, I'll say what happened up there. Um, but here's the first case I remember reading about this. There's this guy driving down the highway and he's pulled over by a cop. And the cop notices some white powder sitting on the floor in the driver's, uh, in the passenger seat. And the cop says, um, uh, to the guy, what is that? And he says, it's fentanyl. And the next thing you know, the cop gets dizzy, passes out and gets taken to the hospital and is diagnosed with, with fentanyl poison, right? Uh, from a non-exposure essentially. And this has happened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. You can't open up the newspaper literally on Google uh, without reading about another case, just like this somewhere in the country. Right. What that does is, again, it stigmatizes an entire population of people. A, officers and, and EMS and other, other folks are often hesitant to get involved with, with people who've overdosed in, for the fear of themselves being poisoned. And B, the gentleman who was involved with this event actually got um, tried for assault and convicted of assaulting an officer and got, it, it got his uh, jail sentence extended. Now, again, I'm not condoning drug use and I'm not saying this is okay, but you have to sort of ask these questions, like how real 
is this, right? Here's an example of, of an exposure in, in California. Here's an officer, this is on Google, I'm not giving any proprietary information, who opened up the trunk of a car um, or of an SUV and suddenly felt faint and passed out. And his, his partner very rightly got concerned and gave him some intranasal naloxone and he woke up, right? That is not fentanyl poison. This is fentanyl poison does cause seizures. It doesn't cause hyperventilation. It doesn't cause diaphoresis and sweating. It causes respiratory depression and coma. None of these pay, none of these quote unquote victims of this exposure had this. In West Virginia, they're, they're just about to pass a bill analogous to the case I just mentioned that makes it a crime to intentionally expose an officer to fentanyl. So all of these people who have you know, all of these officers who get symptomatic after an exposure are going to be, these folks are going to have charges added to their um, charges uh, for assaulting officers. I just want to point out that exposure pathways are really important, right? Fentanyl doesn't jump off of the floor of a car onto an officer or into their nose and cause poison. If that gentleman's driving the car with the fentanyl in it, the officer outside of the car has absolutely zero risk of being exposed, right? In fact, dermal exposure to fentanyl does not cause rapid onset of symptoms. For many of you that remember the fentanyl patch, we'll put it on somebody's skin and it takes three days in a specially formulated patch to reach toxic, not even toxic, therapeutic levels. So there's no way that applying a grain of powder on the skin in a non-specially formulated way is gonna cause that to happen. So what's happening to these officers has been pretty clear. They, like all of us, are susceptible to fear and anxiety. They have been made aware through their societies and their organizations and their, their leaders that fentanyl is really bad stuff. And when they're exposed to it, they get the same level of anxiety that any of us would if we were told the same thing. They're humans, right? This is a normal effect. We call it the nocebo effect. Right? It's kind of the opposite of placebo effect. A placebo effect is I'm going to give you this pill that's going to make you feel better. Now I'm going to give you this pill that's going to make you feel really sick. Right? That's nocebo as opposed to placebo. This is a normal human reaction, but it's caused a lot of problems in the, in the, in the um, harm reduction and, and, and drug use community. So um, with that, I'm going to summarize and I'm going to try to get through some of these Q&As if I can. Remember, fentanyl is huge on the street right now. It's everywhere. Right. Certainly in the heroin world, it's increasingly important in the cocaine and methamphetamine world. We don't have a major meth problem around here yet, um, but we still see some of it. We still see a fair amount of cocaine, but it'll show up in the benzodiazepines. It'll show up, you know, I don't think it's going to show up in cannabis particularly, but it does show up in a lot of places. It's exceptionally potent, milligram per kilogram wise, making it easy to overdose. It is a full agonist, but it easily reverses with naloxone because naloxone is more. Uh, it's both more potent and it has a higher affinity for the receptor. So it knocks the fentanyl off. Massive fentanyl overdoses may not respond, but that's not common. There are a lot of other reasons people don't respond to naloxone, most of which has nothing to do with fentanyl's potency. Right? Treatment with, of addiction with buprenorphine is tricky right? due to the deep dependence that develops from this very prolonged half-life due to the lipophilic effect by which it stores in the fat and just leaches out over time. And as we've talked about a lot, and I know many of you were involved with, there are a lot of sort of adverse social consequences involving you know, the media and its portrayal of this drug, which is really just compounding the problem that many of our substance users face already with stigma and bias and, and other problems like that. Uh, this is my contact information. Um, if anybody wants to, to you know, say anything to me, good or bad, I'm willing to, to talk about it. Um, I might um, stop sharing here, if that's okay, and see um, how we best want to, if we have, we have a few minutes for Q&A, I assume? Yes, we do. So do I can- you, um... you, Have you cataloged any of these? Do you see themes or do you want me to just go down the list? No, it's okay. I can um, share some of the questions with you. Okay, so first off, um, Dr. Nelson, I want to 
you know, let you know how great your presentation was, very informative. Um, and we do have a couple of questions here. Um, so our first question, um, someone asked, I reversed, well, they said, I reversed two people on the street with four milligrams of nasal spray and they both walked away before paramedics showed up. I'm assuming they were in withdrawal and went to find more drugs. In this situation, would you, would you recommend trying to use less of the, the naloxone nasal spray, say two milligrams? It's depending on the formulation you use. It's a good question. I'm, you know, I think it's, it's, it's worth discussing. Most formulations don't let you give partial doses Right, you, you're, you know, if you use the Narcan brand, for example, you have to just give the whole thing. Um, if you use a formulation that that allows you to give a partial dose, I think that's totally reasonable. Um, in my emergency department, my goal is to not wake you up. Right, it's to just make you breathe. Right. So when I tell you we used to give 0.4 milligrams IV, we now give 0.04 milligrams IV. It's a tenfold reduction. It's because the point for everybody woke up. Many of them withdrew. Many of them were angry. They spit. They kicked. They yelled. They vomited. They pooped. They didn't want to be there. So I said, Why am I doing that? Well, I want I want you to be there until you're safe to leave because I know that it's very possible that the duration of the of the naloxone that I just gave you is shorter than the duration of the primary opioid you just used. And it's very possible that mine naloxone wears off, you're going to re-sedate. And in the interim, when you're now in withdrawal, you might go and do something as crazy as shooting up or using more opioid to overcome the effects of naloxone, which you can do because it's competitive. But when the naloxone wears off, you're gonna be worse off than you were before the whole thing started. So in my perfect world, you just want people to breathe. It's a little trickier on the street. Most people walking the street don't have your knowledge level and my knowledge level, and they can't figure out a lot of these things. So we just say we'd rather you go into withdrawal than to die. But I just want to be really clear. Most people who overdose do not die. We have thousands of overdose deaths a year. We have hundreds of thousands in the country, right? But we have millions of uses in the country, probably tens or hundreds of millions of uses in the country. Not that any death is okay, but most people overdose don't die. Wow, thank you. That was good. Um, we have another question. What microdosing protocol do you recommend to use to avoid um, precipitated withdrawal, low dose versus high dose um, buprenorphine? So that raises a great question, which I didn't discuss. So it's because I, I didn't know how much detail people want, but I'll give you a, a quick overview. Um, so buprenorphine is the drug we use, as we've talked about primarily for uh, certainly is what I have access to. I don't run a methadone clinic. Um, and if you believe, as I hope you do, that that medication assisted treatment or medication for opioid use disorder are better than abstinence related approaches, um, you need to get people onto buprenorphine. And that's usually the trickiest part. So historically, when it was only heroin, you could just start with a 0.2, um, I'm, I'm sorry, a two milligram dose of buprenorphine and the risk of precipitary withdrawal was fairly small if you allowed people to sort of develop a degree of withdrawal before you gave it. And again, complex pharmacology, but just go with it. A little bit of withdrawal, count score of eight, give them some buprenorphine and they get better and they've already gotten on buprenorphine. That's heroin. Heroin does not have this prolonged effect that fentanyl and methadone have. Because these other drugs are so hard to do, to, to transition onto buprenorphine, we've taken two approaches to it. That two milligram dose has historically been recommended for heroin is the worst option for people that use fentanyl. The other option is macro dosing, where we start them right on 16 milligrams of fentanyl and it kind of blasts the receptors and transitions them really quickly. That's my preferred approach because I work in an emergency department and I have a short attention span and I want people to walk out on that, on that buprenorphine. If you work in a treatment program, which I also do, because as you've heard, I also practice addiction medicine um, and you want to microdose them, it takes several days, which I don't have in the ED, but you start with tiny little doses, half a milligram twice a day, then a milligram twice a day, then two milligrams twice a day, and you build up the buprenorphine level slowly so it doesn't precipitate withdrawal. So microdosing in that format, and there's a number of formats that people use, right? Uh, that's a, a preferred approach you'll read about. Um, 
uh, I'm blanking on the name of it, uh, but I know it. Um, it'll come to me, I'm getting old. Uh, but there's the microdosing strategy, which works great if you have the time, or the macrodosing strategy, which is a little trickier. And I would always caution people if they don't do this regularly to you know, talk to somebody that does, but it's the alternative approach to doing it. Thank you so much for that feedback, Dr. Nelson. Um, I have another question here. Also for initiating someone on Suboxone who uses fentanyl and, and is at risk of withdrawal, is the answer to increase their initial dose of Suboxone? Right, that was, that's the macrodose question. So the answer is, again, I like 16, some say store with eight, go to 16, um, that's the macro. So you do, it's, it's really hard because you know, it's one of these weird, it's a weirdism in medicine. Most of the time when you give a drug to somebody and they have an adverse effect from the drug, you stop giving the drug. But when somebody is, an op is opioid dependent and you give them buprenorphine and they withdraw from the buprenorphine, what that means is you didn't give enough and you have to give more. It seems kind of paradoxical. So if you gave the two and they withdrew, give eight more. If they give them eight and they withdrew, give them eight more, right? We've given up to 64 milligrams in that initial dose to get people to stop withdrawing. That's atypical. Most is going, going up to you know, 32, 24 would be more typical, but you can definitely go higher. Because of that ceiling effect on respiratory depression, particularly in somebody who's already opioid tolerant, there is essentially no risk of causing respiratory depression in those people. Thank you. Which is the best recommended way to dispose fentanyl patches that we can recommend to our patients? Yeah, fentanyl patches are very specifically, um, they're one of the few drugs that, you know, the FDA allows you to, for example, flush down the toilet, opioids are. Everybody say, you know, whether it's antidepressants or antibiotics, you should always throw them out in the garbage, mixed with kitty litter or something else that'll prevent them from being used. Um, with a fentanyl patch, you have to be very careful to fold it in half. Kids love patches. And when they find them in the garbage, they, they love sticky things, I should say. They'll put them on themselves. Kid, kids skin is not like adult skin. It's even more permeable and they will get sick. Uh, you have to fold them in half. And if you're gonna throw them out, make sure you throw them out in a, in a way that is unretrievable um, or flush them, right? And that's, it, again, because they're, they're, you know, don't dissolve readily, um, uh, they do create a, you know, a, a waste problem, but it, from a safety perspective, and given that the prevalence of use of fentanyl patches is fairly low, it's probably the best bit here. The other alternative, of course, to, is to try to turn them in if you can, uh, but that's not a common mechanism to get that to happen. Good to know. Um, so what is your suggestion for people on the street if we're talking about harm reduction and a reduction of deaths? To, to reduce harm? Is that what you saying? Yeah. So what is your suggestion for people on the street if we are talking about harm reduction and a reduction of deaths? Harm reduction is huge. And obviously, I can't imagine not being a big supporter of harm reduction in every walk of our life, whether it's, you know, alcohol use of kids or safe sex and all this stuff. Um, certainly, uh, there are some approaches to doing this. And easy ones are things like never use alone, right? Because if you use alone, uh, nobody's going to be there to save you. Right. You can't give yourself an naloxone. That's one thing I can assure you. Um, at the same time, if you're with a group of people and everybody's using, it's almost like using alone. So having somebody who's not using is a great approach. The designated driver concept that most of us are used to from drinking alcohol. Um, so that's always nice. It's maybe a little bit unrealistic to think it's going to happen, but if you can, that's great. There are some places uh, that have, uh, New York City's done it, and you know, in Canada, it's, it's popular, and other parts of the the, the country, people are looking at places that are variably called safe consumption facilities or medically assisted consumption facilities, where they actually have a place for you to go and use your drugs with somebody monitoring you who clearly is not using substances at the time. They're usually a nurse or a healthcare provider of some sort who can technically um, monitor you if you over sedate or stop or slow your breathing or even give you an naloxone if you need it. At the same time, most of those places supply needles and other things, which also produces a degree of harm reduction. People that inject drugs, you know, of course, the transmission of hepatitis C and HIV and malaria and everything else through sharing blood is, is always a concern. So those are good approaches to doing it. Again, I'm not very convinced about uh, drug testing strips 
I don't, I don't really see their value, but I, I guess I don't really see their harm either. It's just giving you information you probably already have. Okay, um, I have another question here. Uh, we have a few in the chat box. Okay, can you please elaborate further on fentanyl remaining on receptors? Generally, how long before fentanyl leaves the receptors? Well, fentanyl itself comes on and off the receptor fairly quickly. It's a very short acting drug. When you come to the emergency department, I give you fentanyl lasts for 15 minutes, right? And that's because it redistributes out into the fat. But if there's already a lot in the fat, as my fentanyl goes into, as you know, if you're a heavy user, as the fentanyl goes into the fat, other fentanyl comes out and binds to the receptor. Right, so fentanyl is a short acting drug, but because it's lipophilic, it lives in the body a long time. So depending on your use pattern, it could actually look short acting or it could look long acting. But the fentanyl itself lives on the receptor, the actual molecule for just a very short period of time. But there's so much of it around, when one molecule comes off, another molecule goes on and binds. All right, and we have, we have time for one more. Um, all right, let's see. Is it safe and effective for a MAT patient to, to take both clonopin and opiate and buprenorphine? Buprenorphine, sorry, I'm mixing up the words. So clon clonopin is clonazepam, it's a benzodiazepine. Um, opioids, I guess, could be any of them. That combination is deadly. Um, you know, cl clon uh, all of the benzodiazepines are CNS depressants and to some extent respiratory depressants. So combined with an opioid, they lead to a high degree of respiratory depression um, and you know, have, a, 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 have been pretty highly associated with bad outcomes, lethality in many cases. Um, you know, adding buprenorphine does take the edge off a little bit because as a partial agonist, it, it takes away some of that opioid uh, induced respiratory depression. It would be very hard for me to condone the use of those three drugs together, but I would say that using antibuprenorphine to the mix probably makes it safer. But again, it's hard for me to say that it's a good thing to mix, right? Um, you're still combining things that have respiratory depressant potential, uh, that are both CNS depressants, that both impair your judgment. Uh, so the combination is just probably not, not very good. And I would avoid it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Nelson, for a very informative presentation. This is really great. I mean, I've learned a lot and I'm sure all those who attended learned a lot as well. Um, thank, you one, thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, please fill out the evaluation at the end of the webinar. Um, and, and again, thank you all so much. Thank you again, Dr. N Dr. Nelson. And please stay tuned for our next um, upcoming webinar that will, be, that will take place in, on February 8th. I'll be sending out information about that. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry to get to all the questions and answers. I don't know if there's a way to do that at this point, but but uh, thanks for everybody for, for attending as well. I appreciate it. Yes, I'll see how I can get some of the questions and if I could you know, send them over to you and if you can share them back to I'll me. Try. Then I'll... Yeah, okay. perfect. Thank you. Thank you again, doctor. Take care. Thank you, everyone.